Hey guys, Ian David Clark here again, uh, bringing you another episode of Alpha Advisor. Of course, I'm alongside of my friend, Steve Boker. Steve, how are you doing today? Uh, it's uh, been a pretty day in the market. Pretty ugly, that is, but uh, everything else doing well. Okay, so our show today is a little bit different. We're going to mix it up. Uh, we're gonna. It's called What's Up? Um, and uh, I don't know what Steve's going to talk about. He doesn't know what I'm going to talk about. We're going to see how this works out. Hey, Steve, um, what have you got for us today? What's up? Ian, it's not so much uh, what's up as what's happened. As you know, last week was the end of our RSP season. Actually, it was on Monday. That was March the 1st. And now everybody's scrambling to get their taxes done. And uh, I don't know if you saw the flurry of emails going back and forth this morning, but one thing I had to point out, which is a little bit of a scary thing, and that's ETFs and the way they treat internal capital gains inside the ETF. So at the end of the year, anytime around this time, you're going to get a tax slip from your financial advisor or directly from the ETF advisor, and it's going to show a capital gain there. And you're going to go, well, wait a minute, I haven't sold it, and I didn't get a dividend in cash. What's going on? Well, inside the ETF, they're actually buying and selling securities. And when they trigger those gains, they allocate that pro, pro rata portion to you as an investor. And it's very important that you take that non-cash dividend and add it to your adjusted cost base. Otherwise, when you sell that ETF in the future, you're going to be playing a capital gains twice. Okay, and, is, this, uh, is this what phantom uh, dividends are all about? Yeah, exactly. This is the phantom. It's one expression is a phantom dividend. It's, yeah. it's a non-cash dividend that nobody really tracks. Nobody's really paying yeah. attention to. And it just shows up on your tax slip every February. <laughs> you file it with your tax return. And But what you should be doing is if you bought an ETF at $10 and you're getting a dollar in phantom dividends, after four years, your real adjusted cost base should not be 10, it should be 14. Yeah. So, so you have to you, ha you have to be very wary and and track these things because they're not automatically recorded. Right. Okay. Hey, that's a good that that's tax time. It's coming up. Uh, good. Good that we're making uh, people aware of that. Um, and of course, there's gains in this market. Um, it's you know, and some say that you know this market has gotten ahead of itself, kind of parting like 1999. Uh, but something interesting happened over the last several weeks, and we had a rocket move up in the 10-year. Um, you know, actually, the 10-year of January 1st, Steve, I'm just looking at 0.93 and traded today at around 1.48%. But more importantly, in the last few weeks, it ripped it. And it's the velocity of that that sent stocks backwards, and particularly growth stocks uh, and those in the tech sector. So that's why we've seen the NASDAQ pull back uh, quite significantly. Um, and if this continues, and, 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 and we're seeing some gains in other areas, right? Like, like financials, for example, which tend to do better in a rising rate environment. Um, but I tell you, you know, if the rates continue to go higher, um, you know, that's going to be hurting those secular growth stocks. Because they basically are, rates go higher, that means less future profits uh, are worth less in the in the future in today's dollars. So it is a problem going forward. And, you know, one of the things that you and I talked about is, is, is staying with your quality in the tech side and, you know, be really careful about some of these high flying, yep. uh, high flying yep. overvalued stocks. And, and, and right now, the way I view it, because as you know, as a bond trader in the 1990s, and you're right, it's partially a, a, it's the acceleration we've seen in interest rate changes, but also right now, markets are getting very skitterish anytime the 10-year breaks through 155 to 160. And, and, and uh, that may notch upwards if we see a slow crawl up, you know, two to five basis points a week. It's, it's not going to be as disruptive as all of a sudden you see it go from 135 to 160 in a day and a half. Uh, you're going to have a lot of investors hitting the sell key in the stock market simultaneously with the bond market. Well, yeah, you remember in the 90s, right? Greenspan <laughs> rates, uh, but it didn't it didn't send stocks tumbling. I think it's the velocity of what happened the last few 
another interesting point with these rate rises if, uh, is the 10 year versus gold. And, um, and, and this chart here really shows uh, that the 10 year peaked in, in uh, or bottomed out in 2018 and gold peaked. Then it converged again, and we had another rise in gold with gold with the pandemic. And pretty much since September, gold's been selling off as uh, the tenure has been gradually moving up higher. Uh, so that's significant. But I, I also we were you and I were talking about what that means for stocks going forward in a rate an increasing rate environment. And it doesn't mean you have to unload on tech. Like I, I was looking at Microsoft. Uh, at around Christmas, it was trading at $229 a share. And you and I have had this conversation about uh, Peloton, which is really kind of a stay at home stock. It was trading at uh, record highs of 171. Well, Peloton's at 108 today. Yeah. And, and, and really our discussion in the past was, it works in the pandemic, but as people go back, it's not to say that people aren't going, those that own Pelotons are, 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 are not happy with them. It's just the sales will begin to slow down as we get to re reopening side of things. And, you know, I'm hearing anecdotally, you know, comments about the roaring 20s. There's trillions of dollars sitting on the sidelines. And if the pandemic is, and the rollout of the vaccine is, uh, is improving things, then yeah, that's, that's going to, that's certainly going to be, uh, um, a factor going forward. Well, but you get a blip up in rates as well as uh, um, the uh, a, a pullback in the PE multiples, and you know there there's a lot of air in a lot of stocks. Now, That's right. Like, and you lots you, of value in, in a lot of other ignored stocks. Yeah, yeah. So you've got a, for the utility sector. God, those things are cheap right now. Well, they're coming up, right? They, they're they're starting from a bottom, a lower point. But if you've got the high flying um, growth stocks. They've got to earn those earnings, and if they don't, they get punished. And that's a good example uh, when we look at uh, all these tech stocks right now. If they don't impress, then they're going to get uh, punched to the sidelines. So I, I think we're seeing that that secular uh, rotation. What else you got from uh, Presky? Well, the other thing we're looking at in is, and and this has been one of the hot hot sectors that's just suddenly cooled off, is looking at the electric vehicle markets. Yeah. Uh, you know, this was the Tesla trade, if you will. Yeah. And when Tesla got uh, announced last summer that it was going to be picked up by the S&P 500, it started to move and move in a serious way, uh, taking out any kind of reasonable valuations, but brought along a lot of other companies with it. And, and then, you know, when Wall Street sees something good, they want to make it better. So they unveiled and unleashed multiple new companies that were also in this industry. And, you know, you and I were looking at the comparable costs of, of say, a battery electric vehicle versus a, a, a gasoline powered vehicle. And without the tax credits, you know, the electric vehicles still have a long way to go to become That's cost right. competitive when you include all the other costs that to, to run the vehicle. The alternative, and this has also been catching fire, uh, we saw a Canadian story just hit the, the, the street last week. It's called Loop Energy. And they're sort of a Ballard power um, a splinter off. I, if you look at the people that, uh, that are at that company, they used to be at Ballard Power. They think they might have made a little bit of a tweak to their fuel cell that might provide some more efficiencies. And in point of fact, there is a Deloitte article out there that, that we're, we're looking at that may suggest that fuel cell vehicles will be cheaper and more efficient to run than battery electric vehicles. So plug power, uh, Ballard Power, uh, 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 Green Power. These are companies that are using um, fuel cells to run their, their vehicles. Yeah, but they're still going to have to produce the hydrogen, right? And so whether that's produced from a green perspective or from a not so green perspective, right? I mean, you've got gray power, you've got green power. Exactly. So it, it, green power, a, a green hydro power is coming from uh, clean energy sources, wind, solar, hydro and they're using electrolysis to separate the hydrogen out from the oxygen. And then you run the hydrogen over a fuel cell. It rebonds with the oxygen. You get electricity plus water out the back end of the tailpipe. Okay. Yeah. The only other source, and it's the biggest source right now, is coming from natural gas. Yeah. If you heat up natural gas to a very high temperature, you're able to split off the hydrogen atoms and then uh, compress and, and able to deliver. And, then, and that's why we look at a company like Capital Power, 
which right now, you know, five years ago, it was the biggest coal fired producer in the oh, it was it Alberta. was hated. It was hated. Yeah. They, they, yeah, they were coal powered facilities and the uh, NDP government basically said, uh uh, we're not going to do this anymore. We're only going to buy you if you're producing it from wind, solar or natural gas. So they were given grants to convert their their processes over, but they took yeah. it a, f a step further by by already incorporating that with with the power available or the fuel available, they'll be able to swing from natural gas to hydrogen production. For their so we've got customers. power. We've got power in vehicles. We've got power in the markets. And the big talk right now is democratization of trading. Um, but you know what? I think this is making the rich richer. I was reading something the other day. Charlie Munger was uh, about a week and a half ago. You know Charlie Munger, right? Uh, yeah. Workshop. Did you know he's 97 years of age? That wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, yeah. Up there. He, he, he <laughs> so and his, 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 up yeah, his comments, uh, and I'm going to read it word for word. It's um, this whole Reddit trade and the Robin Hood trade. It's the most egregious in the momentum trading by novice investors lured in by new types of brokerage operations like Robin Hood. And I think all this activity is regrettable. Uh, so he he's um, he's not on the uh, the pro Robin Hood side, but really what this is his comments were also that it's a dirty way of making money. Um, and so this whole democratization thing, right? Um, and a little bit of pushback from from Robin Hood, obviously. Um, it, you know, maybe a combination of a lot of things. You and I remember 1999. And, and certainly there was the, the IPO rage back then. And if you look at this chart right now, um, basically it's, it's outlining that, you know, if you go from 1999 to 2019, the, the amount of IPOs surpassed all of that period in between until we hit 2020. And in 2020, we had over 180 IPOs. And, you know, that's a significant number when you think about it. $180 billion uh, was uh, was dealt out. and But the interesting thing about that, Steve, is it wasn't I, just IPOs. It's something called SPACs, which are special acquisition corps. Now, yeah. you and I have talked about those. You know, like a typical IPO is, is, is out there searching for money, whereas a SPAC is money searching for a company. And exactly, exactly. You know, if you need to get if you need to get yourself listed as a public company and you've been in business for 30, 40 years, whatever the number is, and you decide it's time for uh, various reasons, uh, you know, you, you want to give your existing shareholders some liquidity events, um, the processes and the and the things you have to jump through in order to get yourself public compared to a company that says, guess what, we want to raise $100 million, 10 bucks a share. Uh, we've got a clean balance sheet and we're going to go and look to find a company to buy. Can you put us on the exchange? Yep. And sure it's no a hell problem. of a lot easier. Yep. It's a hell of a lot easier. Basically done overnight, right? And you can, unlike an IPO, which you can't really promote ahead of it, you, you, you're basically with a SPAC, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of open season that we've seen this shift, a tremendous shift in this area. Um, but I would argue that, um, we're starting to see that froth like we saw in 1999 and, you know, it could end badly. You know, we've had this conversation now and, you know, and, and certainly 2020, um, you might've maybe not said that so much, but now this we're, we're heading into a reopening trade. Um, but at the same time, look, the, the, the traders out there, the Robin hood traders are part of this, but who's getting richer um, I was reading this the other uh, this morning. I, I heard this on CNBC. Uh, Dan Gilbert of Rocket Mortgage, in one day, saw his net worth go up thirty billion dollars. That's up in the that's up in the Bloomberg, the Michael Bloomberg sphere. Yeah. Uh, Ryan Cohen, uh, you know, the activist for GameStop, uh, last year had seventy six million, grew to three billion, and then recently dropped to four hundred million then back up to a billion with his emoji ice cream tweet. Um, that's a pretty uh, pretty incredible ice cream cone, $600 million worth. But this is the kind of froth and volatility that could very well end badly. Um, very so well we're, we're, we're careful about that. Uh, in defense, and finally, I just want to finish off, in defense of this, 
there is a new cohort, a new investor. Um, and despite the fact that uh, they're, they're dragged into this, uh, they have more information at their fingertips. The millennials are, are buying. Yes, somebody has to be a seller. Somebody has to be a buyer. So someone's going to get hurt, but there will be winners out of this. And, you know, sometimes that's a way of learning the market is to learn it painfully. But it's the largest cohort and there is a paradigm shift going on. And, you know, the, la the oldest millennial, by the way, is 40 years of age. And I think those ones have moved out of their parents' base room, a base, basement. They're buying homes. Uh, money is cheap. And they're investing. And they're getting wiser and smarter with it. But there's also a cohort that are, are going to get hurt with this. And, and we've seen that before. We've seen that story before. Hey, listen, um, good topics today. Uh, we're going to continue in a couple of weeks. If you like what you see, you know, hit, hit the subscribe button. Smash that like button. We'd encourage some comments. If we get some great comments, you guys, we'll bring them on the air and uh, we'll try to answer your questions as best as possible. And uh, so we're gonna, we'll see you guys in a couple of weeks. Uh, this is the Alpha Advisor uh, signing out. Have a great week. See you later, Ian.